From every mountain and valley the world over are flowers and plants of simple beauty. Some hold a natural wonder, chemicals that soothe pain and inspire euphoria. At times they've been hailed as a gift of heaven, but in the last century they've been condemned as a scourge of man. Once, marijuana, cocaine, opium, ecstasy, LSD, even heroin were perfectly legal. Today, they compel a war on drugs. Did these plants and drugs change, or did we? Drugs are menacing our society. It's like a five-hour orgasm. Used wisely can produce the greatest ecstasy that man knows. 1914. The year sees the outbreak of the world's most savage war. From rat-infested trenches, stinking with dysentery, strong men weep. There are none of the blessings of plasma or penicillin, only the curse of machine guns, poison gas, and bayonets. The only mercy in this hell on earth comes from a flower, the papaver somniferum, the sleep-inducing poppy. Its sap can be turned into the most powerful narcotics in the world. Opium, morphine, and heroin. Drugs that kill pain and induce joy in the brain's neural centers. They also control digestion, body temperature, and breathing. The right dose lets the wounded sleep undisturbed and the dying smile in painless peace. But overuse creates a lethal physical addiction that results in suffering and death. Withdrawal from prolonged use results in agonizing pain. But across the Atlantic, civic and religious leaders fear these dangers and want narcotics banned. But other than a handful of state laws, there is no such thing as an illegal drug. America is a dope fiend's paradise. Historians, various um, writers at the time, tried to figure out exactly how many people were addicted. And the number ranges anywhere from about 200,000 to 1 million people by the year 1900. But that was part of the scary thing. You didn't know for sure who might be addicted to morphine or opium. It might be an honored judge, a respected teacher, um, a trusted physician. Like alcohol, opiate addiction knew no boundaries. And the fact that people didn't actually know, there was no way of sort of counting an, a, an addict population because drugs had no regulation at the time, sort of added to the fear and hysteria that this nation was going to go to, literally, go to pot because our leaders, our mothers, our, our pillars of society very well might be using drugs, and eventually this would lead to the downfall and debility of America. Though condemned in 20th century America, the poppy was once honored as a gift of the gods. 6,000 years ago, ancient Babylonians called it the joy plant and drank the sap or dried it into cakes of opium that were eaten to enhance the pleasure of sex. Centuries later, Alexander the Great used it to conquer the world. He gave it to his army and carried the poppy to India, where it flourished in the subtropic sun and grew more potent. Alexander the Great used it uh, to... You have soldiers who are going to get foot-weary and sore and tired, and also you can't sleep at night with the moaning of the thousands of wounded. Well, if the wounded are sleeping tight because they're doped up and the soldiers are marching longer because they can't feel their feet hurt, then you're going to have a more effective army. Alexander's flower found its way to Roman gladiators. Like his army, they eat opium to fight fearlessly, and if mortally wounded, to die painlessly. Opium's dangers were documented as early as 150 AD, when the physician Galen warned that opium must be used sparingly, and added it was better to endure pain than become bound to the drug, a concept today called addiction. 
But in an era of kill or cure practices, like hacking off limbs, pulling out teeth by hand, leeching, scalding, cupping, and waging war with swords, opium was a miracle drug. For centuries, opium has been the drug of mercy. Before painkillers were prevalent and arrived, uh, before there was anesthesia, opium and all of its derivatives and all of its forms was commonly used by people throughout the Western world and the Eastern world as well as a drug of a certain escape, as a drug to escape from pain, from reality. But the flower of mercy was destined to become the suffering of millions once the new world met the old. 1492, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand dispatched Columbus to find a sea route to India to bring back, among other things, opium. The supply, once furnished by Arab traders, ends with Arab expulsion from Spain, and the country is desperate for another source of the treasured painkiller. Columbus, of course, never reaches India or its opium. He does, however, find something else in the New World, tobacco, a commodity that changes the way opium reaches the brain. Tobacco smoking started in China in the 1590s, 1600s, when the tobacco plant was brought from South America uh, by traders, and the Chinese took to tobacco very swiftly and got to like it. Once they were used to tobacco smoking, it apparently was quite common to somehow put a tincture of opium with your tobacco shot, as it were, and then gradually this moved into taking of the pure drug through inhalation. Smoking opium is a new way of consuming it. One breath sends the drug's chemical endorphins to the lungs and onto the brain. At the strike of a match, opium's joyful highs are more intense. People smoked opium lying on their sides in these, in these pipes that they had developed. And so opium dens and smoking became a social environment. It wasn't simply the taking of the drug. It wasn't simply the escape from reality, the euphoria that came with the drug. It was a euphoria that came amidst other people. And of course, it became extremely profitable, not only for those selling the opium, but for those running the dens. Smoking opium is the ruin of China. By 1800, two centuries after the first opium arrives, one-third of the country is addicted. Though opium has been outlawed for a hundred years, foreigners continue to sell it there. Most comes from British colonial plantations in India. A chest costs two dollars to produce and sells for ten dollars. The misery of China is a financial windfall for Britain. It's about money. It's about huge quantities of money. These are the same people, the same culture, the same civilization that has made millions in the slave trade. Why should we believe that people who took millions, millions of Africans and brought them to the New World would have any sensitivity whatsoever about the opium trade to the Orient, to the East? These are men, these are companies seeking profits. And if you can visit misery on someone you cannot see, then it's just fine, and the profits were enormous. In defiance, China attempts to end the opium trade. Britain declares war. And it was uh, a major defeat for China, as Britain used the new technology of steamships and uh, much better weapons, long-range guns and so on, in, and much more accurate rifles. Uh, at this time. So the Chinese lost and they were forced to sign a treaty in 1842. The Chinese continued to say opium should not be smoked by their own people. The British continued to sell it. The drugs trade in fact increased dramatically after the war. Over the course of 6,000 years opium evolved from a blessing into a curse. It started as dried sap people ate to kill pain and feel joy. But by the 17th century, an accident of history changes its route to the brain and lays the foundation for the world's first drug epidemic. Opium's curse isn't limited to China. In the 19th century, it yields another narcotic to a chemist looking for a way to make opium stronger. The result is the most powerful painkiller in the world. 
and the most addictive. The new narcotic will both bless America with the relief of pain and plague it with the worst epidemic of drug abuse in its young history. Hooked illegal drugs and how they got that way will return in a moment. They want your sweet, innocent girls to take...